Hello and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books made out of skin too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah, and I, 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 it is, it is spooky month. Oh, we are starting you off like right in the deep end with the Books of Blood Volume 1 by Clive Barker. <laughs> yep. Yep. But before we dive in to this delightful romp. <laughs> the faces I'm making right now, listener. Well, that sounds like a ghost moaning from my end. Very timely. I think it, it was just a motorcycle. Yeah, probably. But that's less fun. It. I guess that depends on your definition. <laughs> well, what's something great that happened recently? I'm going to be a little cheesy and say that playing Baldur's Gate 3 with you has been my good thing for this week. That's going to uh, be my good thing too, so we can be <laughs> cheesy together. Okay. But yeah, we've been streaming that in our Discord. Lily is playing and I'm backseat driving. And it's been a lot of fun. For me, anyway. <laughs> Well, it's been fun for me too. I love the game so much, but I've played it so much that trying to decide what kind of run I want to do has become like difficult. So having you to make those decisions has been great. And I hope I haven't spoiled too many things for you. Oh, you've not spoiled anything that I haven't spoiled for myself. Excellent. What are you drinking tonight? The Books of Blood felt like a red wine kind of book to me. So that's what I'm drinking. Hell yeah. I'm drinking herbal tea. It's called Caramel Apple Dream, which sounds much more exciting than it actually is. So I had to improve it a little bit with whipped cream and caramel drizzle on top. Interesting. I'm not sure that's what I would do with that. Well, I probably wouldn't be drinking a tea called that in the first place. Yeah, you don't like herbal tea. To be tea. honest. No, it's not the herbal tea. I don't like fruit teas and I don't like sweet teas. Yeah, I mean, it's not sweet. There's no sugar in it. Except right. for the caramel drizzle I added on top. Right, but something that calls itself caramel apple is going to be too sweet for my, for my taste. Well, it's okay. It's pretty weak, even if you let it steep for a long time. So... I'm glad that you've doctored it. It smells, I would say, better than it actually tastes. And it it smells like fall, which is where we are officially now. Yay. (laughs) Now we have to cling to this for as long as we can before winter starts. Well, have you read anything besides Books of Blood Volume 1 recently? I've been reading our next podcast book, but that doesn't count. But no, I've not read anything because someone has gotten me hooked on Baldur's Gate 3, (laughs) which kind of takes away from my reading time. It won a Hugo, it counts. It does, but it still takes away from my reading time. It does, and I'm sorry. (laughs) The first of many apologize I will be issuing to you this evening. (laughs) Yeah, this was no shade to Clive Barker, but this was not the book for me. No, I mean, I think that means he did his job very well, actually. (laughs) Actually, yes. (laughs) Yes. I guess my answer to that question very quickly is Books of Blood Volume 2. <laughs> that is not my answer. No. So right off the top, we have been doing Spooky Month for a couple of years now. We've read a wide range of novels that we have declared quote unquote spooky. This collection of short stories ain't no camp Damascus. <laughs> this is an ooey gooey horror collection and thank you and I'm sorry. Number two. <laughs> Yeah, as some of some of our spooky month books I have more or less enjoyed even though spooky books or horror is not my genre, but I was making a face the entire time I read this collection. It was yeah, not for me. Very much not for me. So we actually ended up shuffling around our books for this season. This was supposed to be quite a bit later on, I think. Do you think it was better to get it out of the way early? Because now, no Spooky Month book is going to be this bad. I mean, I'm hoping that's the case. (laughs) I'm not sure that I'm quite as sanguine about that possibility as you, but... That's true. I guess I don't remember what we have listed, but I know that our definition of spooky is pretty loose. (laughs) It's pretty loose, and it 
it does cater to my horror tolerances quite a bit. So you're right. This is a lot more on your side of the reading spectrum than I think some of the books that we'll be reading are. I mean, we've kept spooky as a pretty undefined notion on purpose. We tend to go more like, oh, it's eerie. Or, oh, there is a ghost in it. (laughs) (laughs) But I thought, you know, we should have at least one entry that is just true blue, balls to the wall, horror. Clive Barker is a big name in the genre. And I think there's value in reading big names in the genre. Absolutely. Classic, if you will. I did consider having us do Hellbound Heart for this book instead of his collection of short stories, one of his collections of short stories, which is the book that Hellraiser was based on. And it's extra fascinating because he wrote the Hellbound Heart and he at least directed Hellraiser. He might have written and directed it. So like just that interaction of story across formats, I think is really interesting and I might bring it up in a, I'll give you a year off, but I might bring it back up. <laughs> I So the thing about that is that, yes, I think that's a very interesting interaction. I think it would make for a fascinating discussion. I'm not sure that I could both read the book and watch the movie. That's fine. I can do the movie part okay. of it. Like, I'm willing to read the book, but I don't know if I could do both. What I want to do is read some of his fantasy works. Yeah, so I actually, I read the foreword written by him in 1998 for my, like, collection of the Books of Blood volumes. And it he starts right off with, it's kind of a bummer that I'm just the Halloween guy and no one cares about anything else that I've done. <laughs> so... As I have apologized to Sarah, I am now obligated to apologize to Mr. Barker, but yeah. Maybe maybe we can add one of his fantasy books to the calendar next year. I would love that. Because it, it's not that he is only horror, it's just that horror is only him. Maybe that's... <laughs> and it's not only him, but like, when I think of classic horror, especially literary, I think of him. I mean, he's a big name in the genre. That Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that's all he writes. Well, I've read some of his other novels that I think are, I mean, nowhere near this end of the horror spectrum. They're still probably considered horror because there's some monsters, there's some sexual assault, and, you know, they're freaky. They freak you out. Which I think I have decided is part of my definition of horror is freaks you out. (laughs) Vague, yes, also accurate. But it's really interesting seeing, like, even in this collection, some of the stories were just, like, slasher gore, and then some of them were much more conceptual. And still gory, but also conceptual. <laughs> there there was a wide variety of types of horror in this collection, yes. I especially love short stories as a format for horror so do I'm, I. <laughs> yeah, I suspect, for a different reason. <laughs> I suspect for very different reasons. My reason is that it means that they're over sooner. <laughs> well, also this might just be, I think world building really gets in the way of horror, or it can, in a way mm-hmm. that it doesn't necessarily for other genres. And like, I don't need to know the origin of demons on Earth. I don't care what all the rules are. I only need to know what's relevant right now. And so in a short story, an author can get away with being much more focused on what they're trying to do and not get caught up in the, (laughs) but what language do demons speak? (laughs) Interesting that you say that because I don't necessarily think that that's horror specific. It's not horror specific, but I think horror especially shines because of it. Mm. And when you get longer form horror, I think as either the world building is either done shitty (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or bogs down the scariness mm. more often. I guess I don't read enough horror to be able to comment on how that compares with other genres and specifically. That's, and that's not like a blanket rule by any means. I, I like long form horror as well. It's just something that I've noticed, I think. 
That makes sense. When I was trying to decide which collection to have you read, to force you to read, to... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Story later that's literally called Dread. You mean in, in one of these volumes <laughs> yes. uh, of the Books of Blood? Yes. But this volume, A, it starts with Book of Blood, <laughs> which is like a really fun meta introduction to the series or not it's not a series they're unconnected short stories but there is sort of a a concept around it but there are some really neat concepts that get brought up it's not just serial killer shit it's it's not i mean there there was a lot of gore there is a ton of gore (laughs) (laughs) there was a lot of gore there's too much gore for me yeah this is not the book for you and thank you for indulging me it's not i mean I tend to set our calendar the rest of the year. Obviously, you have veto power, but usually it's me going, hey, I want to read this book. Let's read this book. So it is only fair that there's at least one month where you can read, where you can have uh, more of a say. Yeah, I mean, our tastes overlap quite a bit, though. And so it's not... (laughs) You don't usually go out of your way to pick a book that you know I won't like. (laughs) Except in the case of Kushiel Start. <laughs> okay. Well, even that was not on purpose. No, that was not on purpose. Although the sequel was. Yeah. But you ended up liking the sequel, or not the sequel, but the... The retelling. The retelling from Jocelyn's point of view. You ended up liking that, for the most part, more than the original. That's true, yes. But in this case, I did choose this specifically so that you would have a bad time. And <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Okay. <laughs> I have broadened my education in (laughs) horror. Now, this is an anthology of short stories. Normally, we wouldn't have a spoiler section in this case. And in fact, our non-spoiler conversation has been very short. But I do think because it's horror, there is something so... I'm going to say delightful again, and I know you argue with that. (laughs) Part of the joy for me in reading horror is the kind of the mystery aspect of it, finding out what is going on or what the answer is, or, you know, your main characters have been tormented across several pages, like why, the why of it. And I don't want to ruin that for anyone who does not want to have that ruined. It's going to be a collective spoiler section for all of the short stories. So yeah, it's an all or nothing, but I, I mean, I actually think that having a spoiler section for this is good for a different reason, mainly that it gives us an opportunity to build in our content warnings instead of you having to record them afterwards. Yeah. Because there's a lot of gore, there's death, there's animal death. It's a horror collection and it goes very hard on things that are not comfortable to read. There's so cannibalism there's is it can well there's kind of cannibalism i'm gonna throw it in there (laughs) there are uncomfortable relationships which is both overstating and understating it at the same time and being no help at all for someone who's trying to figure out if it would be terrible for them i don't think there's any sexual assault in this collection Mm, no i don't think so there's sexual content in occasionally violent settings, but it's not the act being violent. It's not, there's not there's, consent stuff. Yeah, I was, that was just what I was going to say. The issue around that is not the, is not consent. Yeah. But there's like awful power dynamics in a couple of them. Yeah. Hello, future Lily here. We forgot a very important content warning, which is self-harm slash suicide. There will be quite a bit of discussion about that content in this book or in this short story in the next section. Wanted to give you all a heads up. It makes the reader uncomfortable. It freaks you out. Again, I was making a face the entire time I read this collection. Yeah. (laughs) I did think it was pretty funny. All of the quotes on the back of, or my collection anyway, are the vaguest, blandest things. They're all just like, 
oh, it's so scary, bro. <laughs> Every single one. It doesn't tell you anything about what you're actually getting yourself into. And I guess that's hard with a short story collection, but still. Yeah, I mean, especially one that is as varied as this. Well, before we dive into the spoiler section, who should read this book? I would say if you have a strong constitution <laughs> and enjoy being freaked out. Yeah, if you like horror, particularly the gory kind, which I know we've said that this is not all gory horror, but there's a lot of that in there. And I think that you will be better served reading this collection if you do enjoy that than if you don't. <laughs> yes. Um. It's very visceral. Like the descriptions, there's a description of a guy getting knocked around by poltergeists. Barker describes his floppy penis flapping around. <laughs> like... It was not a sexual context at all in that moment. But yeah, if you're getting thrown around, your penis would probably also be flopping. <laughs> it's true. But he he joins that there's a lot of taboos, including combining thoughts of sex and violent situations. There's a reason why he's a, a classic, right? And not because... It's a fun, cozy read. But if you do want to cuddle up under a blanket with a hot beverage on a cold, dark day and maybe not go to sleep. The first time I read this, I was up until like 4 a.m. Because I was like, I could just lay here with my eyes closed or I could read the next one. <laughs> I did not have that problem. I was like, I'm not going to read the next one. I have finished. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about these in a little bit more specifics, huh? This episode of Fiction Fans is brought to you by Fiction Fans. That's us. We really appreciate our patrons because otherwise we fund this podcast entirely ourselves. Patrons can find weekly bonus content, monthly exclusive episodes, and they have free access to our biannual zine, Solstitia. You can find all of that and more at patreon.com slash fictionfanspod. Thank you for all of your support. The remainder of this episode contains spoilers. Okay, now I will ask, do you have a favorite story in this collection? I think it has to be The Yattering and Jack, because I find it conceptually so interesting, and I love how it leans more on that than trying to freak you out in a, in a horror collection. It really shows range i would say but the one that's lingers with me the most and so freaks me out the most is definitely pig blood blues the image of the pig possessed by the dead kid eating the main character alive was a lot it is a lot <laughs> yeah it's a lot and just the letter that the other kid writes that he asks the main character, the new teacher at the detention facility, to give to his mother because it'll be censored and not sent if he sends it normally, is so sad. Just um, so matter of fact, like, they're gonna tell you I ran away, but it's not true, mama. They fed me to the pig. It's just like... I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except that he's also kind of complicit in everything that happens, so... His letter lost a little bit of power for me after that. Well, he doesn't end up getting eaten. And so he ends up on the side of the pig. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. the, the kid's name that possesses the pig. Uh, Another reason why I loved that one is how long it strings along the main character slash reader, where you're not sure if it's just like mass hysteria and all of the boys in this detention facility and some of the teachers have just decided that this pig can talk and the main character is pretty sure that they're all just crazy but then it turns out that no the young man who hung himself does in fact possess the pig he does and it's kind of interesting because i was never like i was not ever thinking that it was going to be mass hysteria no i mean these stories are all very like supernatural anchored but i i liked that that was a question for the main character or not even mm. a question but I, I liked that there was that 
ambiguity in the text. I mean, I think it's understandable that the main character does not initially jump to the conclusion that there's something supernatural going on. Mm. Even if we as the reader obviously know <laughs> that, that there's going to be. Yeah. Do you have a favorite or a least terrible story? Possibly The Yattering and Jack, which I think that I've read before. Because I've, and I had not read anything else in this collection, definitely. But I started that story and I was like, I know this. And that feeling stayed with me through the end of the story. I'm not sure when I would have read it or where I would have read it or how I would have read it, (laughs) but I do think that I have read it. I liked that a lot, except for the collateral damage that occurs while Jack is trying to basically outlast and outwit the Yattering. Namely, all of his cats that he just lets the Yattering kill, and then also his daughter. Like, couldn't he have gone out to lunch with them and been like, hey guys, there's something a little wonky going on. I can't really talk about it. Or maybe I'll talk about it as long as you pretend that you don't know about it. I feel like he didn't have to just completely leave them in the dark. Yeah, I mean, yeah. (laughs) So, and that doesn't end up very well for him. So that I didn't enjoy, or that aspect of the story I didn't enjoy. I did like Sex, Death, and Starshine just because I enjoy the theater. That one's also like, okay, I guess guess there's a little bit of zombies. But other than that, that's not horror at all. <laughs> I would say it's it's definitely horror. There's a couple of murders. There's some there's some gruesome murders. There are zombies. It's definitely horror, but it you're right, it's on the lighter side of things. Which is why I liked it also. Yeah, I really loved that image at the end of it's the theater's last show before it gets torn down and turned into apartments or something awful. And so a dead couple who had performed on the stage in its heyday, like bring all the zombies to watch. And so it's just this entire audience of zombies or undead. They're not zombies, but you know, they're zombies. And just that moment of the show goes well, these kind of, if not C-list actors just having an amazing performance and the audience being super into it for like the first time and everything I mean, is they're, nice and good. They're and definitely th- community theater actors yeah. with the exception of the star that they get who doesn't even perform because she gets killed by one of the zombies for being just terrible at it. I, so my thing with this is that it could have been a really cute story and I would have liked it a lot had there been a little less graphic murder. Yeah, I mean, even everyone could have died if it had just not been on screen, and I think you would have liked it a lot more. Yes. If it had not been quite so descriptive in how people died, uh, if that had been hand-waved away a little bit more, it would have been more for me. And I think that's why I like this collection so much, is that even when... Barker is writing a story that's not even about the horror. Like, this story ends with a roving band of undead theater like performers doing a traveling show for all the cemeteries. Which like, I love. <laughs> that is great. a great concept. <laughs> like, A plus fantastic would read, except that everything else is just a little too gruesome for me. Yeah. Which I like because it's. I feel like you do get stories where people die and it kind of, like you said, it glosses over it. And that makes it less intense and also in some way that cheapens the deaths, right? Like if Mm. a character is going through these awful things, I'm not going to say you owe it to them to see it, but... I think for me, what would have made this story entirely to my taste... And it would have removed it from being horror entirely, is mm. that the deaths are not purposeful. Mm. Like something happens and the theater burns down and some of the actors die or all of the actors die. 
but the theater is not intentionally set on fire to kill the actors so that they have people who will come and perform in this troupe. Interesting. Yeah. But and, and- again, that takes away <laughs> all of the horror elements of the story. It's fascinating, right? Because that is the exact same plot, but a completely different story. Yes. And that is a very cute, sweet book. <laughs> Did you have a least favorite? Everything else. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really very much not a gore person. And everything else has a lot of gore in it. So they were not for me. Funny enough, we probably would land on the same least favorite, uh, which for me is Midnight Meat Train. I know it's the famous one that's been turned into a movie, but I think it's the weakest in the collection. How so? It The concept doesn't tie together as well as the other ones do. Like it, it introduces this idea that, oh, there's a there's an underground shadow government of cannibals who need to be fed, and they're the ones actually pulling all of the strings in New York City. But that's the reveal after we just see like one random guy murdering people. And how is there not an organized cover-up? How is it just one guy acting alone if it's the entire shadow government depending on him? Like, it it doesn't linger in the same way as the other stories do, because it doesn't hold up when you think about it longer. And I'm not saying that, like, Pig Blood Blues is perfectly logical. (laughs) That story is nonsense. But it's nonsense in a way that my brain chews on instead of pulls apart. I mean, I think it has a little more internal cohesion. I agree with you there. I did like the concept of some kind of personification of the city. I wasn't necessarily viewing it as a shadow government, but... Yeah, that's my uh, shorthand for not bothering to get... They're called the fathers of the city. Right, and I was viewing it as some kind of personification of how the city can, or, or cities in general, can take people in and chew them up a little bit absolutely and that is a good concept it was also i believe written when crime was really high in new york city Mm. so i think that there's definitely some cohesion there but i think it leans too hard on the metaphor now the scene where the original killer is like getting ready for his day and he's just like a lame middle-aged man the like ordinariness of him preparing his murder and butchery compared to the really graphic and awful violence that he enacts on people, I think was like a very good unsettling, not comparison, but juxtaposition. Yeah. I mean, I still really like it. I really like this whole collection, but I do think Midnight Meat Train is the weakest. Agree with you that it's probably conceptually the weakest. I don't necessarily think that it was my least favorite. Like, if you gave me a million dollars, or even a hundred dollars, to choose a least favorite in this collection, it it would probably either be Pig Blood Blues or In the Hills, The Cities, because of how that imagery lingered more and how unsettling and more coherent <laughs> some of the internal logic was. So I guess in that sense, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Because my reasons for why they're my least favorite are why they're better than Midnight Meat Train. Yeah, Pig Blood Blues is so unsettling. It makes me deeply uncomfortable. And there's so much going on. And there's like, it just kind of throws in the accusation that the main character, like he's the shop teacher. He's the new shop teacher at the detention facility for juvenile delinquents not even delinquents they're all like considered past redemption right they've done horrible awful things they're like 14 to 17 or whatever and at one point another teacher accuses him of being interested in one of the boys and internally he's just kind of like oh is that why i want to save his life i was like excuse me (laughs) what the fuck it, that's that's pretty terrible. <laughs> it was awful. And then it was like, 
that was the same boy that the the pig boy <laughs> i should remember those characters names but i don't at all had been obsessed with before he killed himself and like there's something going on there like why is this one kid such the object of desire and that makes me start thinking and like I don't like any of it. I didn't think that it was the boy who killed himself who was obsessed with the remaining boy. I thought it was the remaining boy was obsessed with the boy who killed himself. Well, everyone was obsessed with the boy who killed himself. <clears throat> but True. also, the boy who killed himself. Like, the, the headmistress... She's not... Is she the headmistress? The head teacher woman does say that they had been involved. Although, we're not really they had, sure... They had been friends... No, she said that they had been together wow. before the boy killed himself. But we're not really sure if she's telling the truth because she was also sleeping with the boy who killed himself. But maybe that's why she hated the first boy so much. Like, I don't want love triangles with teachers and students. <laughs> but also it makes me think about it and I hate that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I don't want to think about it. Yeah, that, that was I, I did not like that story. <laughs> it was not for me. <laughs> Okay, the Yattering and Jack. Other than the awful cat deaths, I love so much that it's about a boring guy who borings his way to victory. <laughs> it's wonderful. <clears throat> I The thing I enjoyed about that was the reveal, not at the end, but like near the end, that Jack knew exactly what he was doing. That was a good reveal. And again, if the Yattering had been a little less violent towards the living beings in the house i would have liked this story quite a lot because it's more on the spooky side but there's also something really humorous about the concept of a demon being sent to torment this person and failing and just like the bureaucracy of it felt very Pratchett-esque to me. But then there was the cat deaths and the, you know, turning the, the daughter crazy and that, yeah. I didn't like that bit. I wasn't necessarily sure that she was all the way crazy. I think she just couldn't handle the events of that night. But we don't see her afterwards. I think she could have recovered. I, I think she just had a breakdown in reaction to the immediate events. I didn't get the impression that she was going to recover, but it's true. We don't see her afterwards. She could go to therapy and, and get better. And yeah. I hope she does. But yeah, I mean, if it weren't for the cats, then I would say that this is like not even horror. I would say it counts as horror, but on the milder side of things. Okay. It, it would be so far on on the palatable side of horror. It would be on the spooky side of horror, not the like... <laughs> Horror side of horror. <laughs> yes. He's a gherkin importer. He is so chill. He defeats the demons. <laughs> but <laughs> like, he's chill on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're right. That twist of like being fully aware of what was going on and using the demons rules against him was just, yeah, I loved, I loved that story. It was very good. It was good, except, except that he knowingly buys more cats after his first cat is like horribly killed yeah i do think that there was an aspect of it that he couldn't let the demon know that he knew because then it wouldn't be infuriating right that's, that's absolutely the point but that doesn't mean that i have to like it <laughs> no yes but at least it's justified right it's not he's just a monster <laughs> he could have only bought one more cat he didn't have to buy two or he could have switched to goldfish or something or he could have switched to goldfish yeah he could have said out loud something that would justify, like, a a lower impact pet death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, that part makes me uncomfortable, and I don't like it, and that's what <laughs> makes it a good horror story. Well, the final one that we need to talk about, In the Hills, the Cities. You have a note here that I really, I really don't like. This is the true reason why I chose this collection. Oh, we haven't even talked about Books of Blood. It's not actually... Oh, actually, no, it is interesting. I liked that it went from a fake 
seance to a real seance. That was a fun flip. And then the idea that this victim has had all of the ghosts carve their death stories into him. He's the Book of Blood. And then we're reading all the, the stories that have been carved into him. Is not like explicitly stated, but it's kind of implied. Would have liked it more had there not been the weird, uncomfortable between the fake, fake psychic, mm -hmm. yeah, and the researcher who was putting on the the study, and then See, they they end up kind of together, and it, I just didn't like that. I hated that she was creeping on him until it turned out that he was faking it all for her attention and then it was like oh you both suck and deserve each other i mean yes but like i don't know just i just didn't like it and the way that he it talks about him masturbating while he's pretending to be a medium for all of these ghosts passing through it was gross yeah yeah, I just, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. That's fair. <laughs> the ending paragraph of like, we are all books of blood, like written in blood and our stories are written in us is such like a beautiful passage. And then the meta aspect of it for the, the rest of the collection, collections plural, makes me like this better than Midnight Meat Train. But it's probably like second to last on my list. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would rate it about... Uh, midnight meat train level of there's not a lot going on but it has yeah. enough gems that like i really latch on to yeah I, th I think obviously if i if i take out how i feel about horror as a whole <laughs> from my rating i i do think that those two are about equal for me and they are like bottom of this collection i don't know if i would say that one is better than the other they're they're about the same for me now, in the hills, the cities. I hate, I hate your note. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. We have to work our way up to it. It starts off, most of this is just like the crumbling of a relationship between two young men who are going on a road trip through Eastern Europe. Yeah, it's implied they're married. This is their honeymoon. It does keep using the word honeymoon, but was gay marriage legal? I don't, I don't know, but they clearly jumped into things when they shouldn't have because they have nothing in common. They're both assholes. They're simply incompatible. Maybe they wouldn't be such assholes if they weren't stuck on a road trip with someone that they clearly didn't enjoy the company of. Yeah. And doing all the things on a road trip you shouldn't do, like criticizing the driver. Just don't criticize the driver on a road trip. Just don't. It's not worth it. <laughs> And while this is happening, they're driving through, like, <clears throat> was it rural Yugoslavia or something? Something like that. Yeah. We're also getting, like, scenes in one of these very rural villages preparing for an annual celebration. It's not annual. It's every 10 years. 10 years. Thank you. But it's definitely something that they've done before. This is not like a, a, a fit of... It is a regular celebration. Craze. Yeah. Where everyone in the city ties themselves together into a giant and then another neighboring city or village because it's very, very small. I guess the title of it is cities. So I forgive myself for saying city. But anyway, and then they have a big giant fight, which is like an absolutely bonkers premise. <laughs> <laughs> it's very bonkers. It's just like simply strange until you get to the descriptions of the workings of these giants. And this year it goes horribly wrong and one of them collapses and then the other one kind of goes berserk. And then when I say one, I mean the city of all of these people working in unison. It is so cerebral. I like... I hate it. I have so many questions for Clive Barker. <laughs> I hate it. Why would the people in the city agree to do this? Why are there children in there? Why are there old people? Like, why well, do this, they not put safety measures in? This There are supposed to be safety measures. If you recall, this year, 
one of the like organizers had passed away so it was her daughter's first time being in charge of it and so she did a bad job right but even in the city that's left the city that doesn't have those problems they still talk about children in there and old people in there it's the well, entire yeah. city so that's but, not a safety i mean that's not a safety issue gone wrong that's just there's no safety there why well, that's because Why they're not supposed to be out? in danger. And there were people watching who were not physically able to be part of the the big giant. Yeah, but there should have been more people <laughs> who were not physically able to be part of us. I love that this is the problem you have with it. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of problems with it, but this is the most immediate problem. Also, the visceral, like, the people who were the, creating the bottoms of the feet just being crushed over time. Also, how is that not a problem every year they do this? Uh, magic. How does a giant made up of a bunch of human beings chained together have a single consciousness by the end of it? How do they, like, decide to walk anywhere they walk? You can wave your hand a little bit. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, the most important thing about this short story is that is the only thing I can ever think of whenever we read a Tiffany Aching novel from the Discworld series. I hate it. And now it's stuck in your head too. I, You're welcome. I, I hate that comparison. <laughs> because it's, in the it's Tiffany terrible. Aching... <laughs> why, the... why would you do this to me? <laughs> I have ruined the We Free Men for you. I'm sorry. And you're welcome. No. Because in the We Free Men... The Knack McFeagles, the little sprite dudes, they're like, what, six inches tall? At one point, they do have to impersonate a regular sized person. And so they do the like three kids in a trench coat, except it's like 20 Knack McFeagles in a trench coat, pretending like they're a regular sized person. And as soon as we read that, I was like, Sarah, I hate <laughs> all it. I can think of is in the hills, the cities. <laughs> I hate it. And then when the Knack McFeagles, who are part of the knees, were complaining, I was like, yeah, when you're on the bottom, you get crushed. I've already read this documentary. I hate it. <laughs> it no, this does um, not spark joy. <laughs> the range of, I don't want to say human experience, because humans have not experienced either of these. The human imagination that can take the same concept and take it into such different directions and tones is, like, that's magical. That's humanity right there, and I love it. I mean, that is very much our discussion about Sex, Death, and Starshine, how the story that I want to read and envision is a cozy fantasy versus the horror novel that Clive Barker or the horror short story that that Clive Barker actually wrote that's true and I think that's I mean that's genre right you can have the exact same plot points but if the the feels are different <laughs> the tone the, the <clears throat> ambiance it completely changes the reading experience yeah I mean I, I think it's incredible the way you can give the same prompt to 20 different authors and come out with 20 different stories from it yeah. And some of this is really emphasizing that. Mm -hmm. I, to be fair, in my note that I said sex, death, and starshine has a fun, spooky concept, you could probably replace fun with neat, and then you would agree with me more. I would agree with you more if you said neat rather than fun. Yeah. In the Hills, the Cities first just like feeds my toxic relationship romance love love of toxic relationships in romance is the correct order for that sentence and like i remember the first time i was reading it being a little bit bored because that's not what i was looking for at the time and like i knew it wasn't gonna be like lovers to enemies or anything so i was like what <laughs> why am i getting invested in these two dudes and then suddenly the giant starts crumbling and it is it's cool I didn't like it. I mean, I, I think it's very well written. I think all of these are well written. This was maybe my third favorite of the collection, if I had to put them in ranked order, but I, not for me. Well, that's a great example of disliking something doesn't mean it's bad. Just oh, absolutely. It's not for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know you know that, but <laughs> it's a, like, 
these are all very good okay well they're not all very good short stories they're all on some spectrum of dang good (laughs) but it doesn't matter how good something is if it's just not for you or like in the hills the cities for me not for me in that very specific moment i was reading it yeah I mean, and I think we've talked about this before, but as you say, there definitely is a difference between something being bad and something being not for you, either not for you entirely or not for you in that moment. Mm -hmm. And this collection, we knew going into it that it would be not for me, but that doesn't make it bad. I I do think it's a good collection. I think the stories are well written and they do what they set out to do. I just hate them. <laughs> I also really love Clive Barker's prose quite a bit. Even when it's being ooey gooey, especially when it's being ooey gooey. Yeah, so it just makes that simple act of reading them very enjoyable for me. His prose was good, but again, I did not enjoy it <laughs> because it was too ooey gooey. <laughs> I would love to read one of his less intense, I mean, just one of his fantasy novels. I think it would be really interesting. To yeah, see how I, it how it goes for you. I think that would be great. And I'll feel pretty, a little less guilty pigeonholing him as the Halloween guy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I actually own an ebook copy of Imagica because it was on Kindle sale or, or on sale on Amazon or something. And I was like, Clive Barker, that's that horror author that Lily likes, but it's not horror. I'll buy it <laughs> for 99 cents. So I also feel like I bet I bet you a million dollars. Clive Barker could write an eerie fantasy and people would call it horror, even if that's not accurate, because they're going to read more into the dark elements than they would for a different author. I bet you're probably right. Now, is that true for this book? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no idea. We can talk about this later, though. Books of Blood! I'm going to go read a thousand more of them. There's not that many. I wish there was. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm very happy to have called it at the first one. A whole month left, Sarah. Yep. Yep, there is. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. Come tell Sarah she's wrong about horror. We're on Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, and TikTok at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at fictionfanspod at gmail.com. I'm not necessarily going to argue that I'm not wrong about horror. (laughs) I just don't like it. And that's the wrong opinion. (laughs) I'm a wuss. I'm not saying other people can't like it or that it's bad. No, no, no. I I just just don't want to read it. But I am obligated to give you a hard time about it. It's, It's true. Anyway, if you enjoyed the episode... And if you enjoy horror, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. We also have a Patreon where you can support us and find exclusive episodes and a lot of other nonsense. Thanks again for listening and may your villains always be defeated. Bye! Bye.